So now we've seen the uniform distribution, our first example, which is the kind of thing we were using before. Now let's see a new example of a different distribution. So it'll take us a minute to build up to it. First, we want to define some simpler things. So an experiment with two possible outcomes. which you can call one and zero, or yes and no, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but let me say they're often called success and failure. Uh, is called a Bernoulli trial. So if we have a Bernoulli trial and the probability of success is P, we'll remember, so first of all, what are our requirements for probability distribution? The first is that this must be between zero and one. The second is that the two probabilities well, in this case, two. So the second is that the sum of all the probabilities in the sample space should add to one. In this case, there are just two elements of the sample space. And we said the probability of the first is p. So the probability of the second must be one minus p. Because then these two things will add up to one. So in fact, here already is a new example of a distribution. So S equals success failure. Um, probability of success equals P. Probability of failure equals one minus P is a Bernoulli distribution. Did I spell that right? I think so. So I will usually call them Bernoulli trials. And it's probably going to be because we are using them to build up more complicated distributions. But you can think of this guy by itself as being a little example of a distribution. We have our sample space consisting of two outcomes. And we have assigned each of them a probability which no longer has to be one half. It can be anything between zero and one. Hmm. So for example, a coin flip is a Bernoulli trial. Um, so in this case, Maybe we're saying heads is success and tails is failure. But the point is just that there's two outcomes. And let's say I'll write it as heads. So this is a Bernoulli trial with p equals 1 half. And in general, often think of Bernoulli trials more generally as a biased coin. Essentially because you have two possible outcomes, just like a coin, heads and tails, but you call it a biased coin because you don't know that they have probability one half and one half, it could be more likely to have heads, more likely to have tails, et cetera, et cetera. So this is our Bernoulli distribution or our Bernoulli trials. And a binomial distribution is going to be a combination of 
a bunch of these things. So let's do an example from which we will see the general picture. Say we have a bias coin, which is to say we are doing Bernoulli trials. So this is going to be a Bernoulli trial with probability of success or heads is two thirds and probability of failure or tails is one third. So we if we flip this coin seven times, what is the probability that we get four heads? Whoops. Let me just write it like that. What's the probability that out of these seven flips, we get exactly four heads? And um, remember, we defined independence. So I guess we'll get to this in a second. But we are going to assume slash declare that flips are independent of each other. So actually, let me reinforce what we were talking about last time and say we declare that they are mutually independent. Because you will remember that there is a difference between being pairwise independent and being mutually independent. So we assume all of our coin flips are mutually independent. Which, I mean, slash, by assume slash declare, I mean that you can think of assuming that for our mathematical formalism, or you can think of it as we know for a fact in real life that one flip of a coin will not affect the next flip of the coin, and that's what independence is supposed to mean. So, in this situation, how do we write this down in our formalism? So, S. is strings of seven letters H or T. And if we're thinking of this as being the sample space of our distribution, then we should use a uniform distribution because all of these outcomes are equally likely. And now E is strings of four heads and three tails. So we want to compute the probability of E. So how do we do this? Well, we have to use the independence of these coin flips. So, um, oh, excuse me. These are not uniformly distributed because our coin is biased. If we had a fair coin, then it would be uniformly distributed because heads and tails are equally likely. But using a biased coin, oh, let me make a note of this because apparently people like me are apt to be fooled. It's not uniformly distributed. Mm. So to compute probability of E, we need to calculate the probability of each of the things in the set and add them all up. So let's do that. Recall, um, so mutual independence tells us 
that the probability of just to pick a random example, getting heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads. So this is seven coin flips. Uh, if I have counted correctly, there are four heads and three tails. So this is the kind of thing that is going on in our event E. And the fact that they are mutually independent means that we can write this as the product of the probabilities individually. This is because saying we get this sequence of heads and tails is the same as saying that first is heads, second is heads, seventh is heads, with some tails in the dots, etc. So we think of this as an intersection, and then independence tells us that we can write it as this product. And now each of these things, we know what this is. Let's pull that back up on the screen. Probability of heads is two thirds and probability of tails is one third. So this probability is equal to two thirds to the fourth times one third to the third. Hmm. In fact, For all elements of our, of our event, what is the probability of s? Well, to get this answer, all we needed to use was the fact that there are four heads and three tails. And that is true of all of the events, all of the outcomes in E. That's the definition of E. So they're all the same probability. They are all 2 thirds to the fourth times 1 third to the third. So the sum over all the elements in E of the probability of that element, since they're all the same, is just equal to the cardinality of E times uh, this thing. So now we just need to compute the probability of E. Sorry. Now we need to compute the cardinality of E, number of elements. Hmm. And this, so we should know how to do from our counting days earlier this week. E is strings of seven letters, four H's and three T's. So how do we count this? Well, one way to think about it is we need to choose four of the seven flips to come up heads. And the others will come up tails. And this means that it is seven choose four. So now we can put everything together to find the probability of E, which we define to be this sum in our new definition is equal to this product, which is seven choose four times two thirds to the fourth times one third to the third. And just for our uh, curiosity, this is about 0 0.26. So with this biased coin, the probability of getting four heads is about one and a quarter, or one and four, rather, which is surprisingly high, uh, which you can, you know, you may have suspected since the coin is biased. So here is our example. And this example is sort of a prototypical example of a binomial distribution. 
So binomial distribution is when we perform a certain number of independent Bernoulli trials and ask what is the probability of getting a certain number of successes. And this exact same reasoning will tell us a formula for the probabilities in this distribution. Namely, this thing right here is essentially going to be the general formula. So let's write all that down. What did we just say? In general, so if we perform n independent Bernoulli trials, with probability of success equals p, then the probability of exactly k successes in our n trials is so it's this formula, and how do you remember it if you've forgotten it? So we need k successes. That's probability of success to the k, one for each success. Then we need n minus k failures. So that's one minus p to the n minus k, one for each failure. And we multiply that by the total number of ways to choose which trials end in success and which trials end in failure which is n choose k. So, this gives us an example of a distribution. So the distribution is our sample set S is 0, 1 through n. This is all the possibilities for the number of successes in n trials from all failures to all successes. And our probabilities are P of K is N choose K. Do those look different enough? They don't look super different. N choose K, there we go. Uh, P to the K, one minus P to the N minus K. is called a binomial distribution. Hmm. So a couple things more to say about this. I think our example serves as a good illustration of where this kind of thing will come from. But for example, we want to show that this is indeed a distribution. There are a couple things to check. And in the course of this, maybe if the name binomial distribution is not entirely clear, we'll see where that comes from as well. So we want to check this requirement that the sum of the probabilities is equal to one. And the way we do this is just by applying the binomial theorem. So what does this look like in our situation? It looks like the sum k equals zero to n of n choose k p to the k one minus p to the n minus k. Because this is the sum over all elements of our sample space. And this is the probability of each element in the sample space. And what does the binomial theorem tells us? Well, the point is that we can recognize this formula as being exactly what we would get if we expanded k 
p plus 1 minus p to the n. If you remember the binomial theorem, it tells you that if you have a binomial, so here are the two terms in our binomial, and you take it to the nth power and expand it, you get binomial coefficients, and you get each thing to corresponding powers, and you take the sum over all k. So this is exactly using the binomial theorem. And that is why it's called the binomial distribution, because these are essentially just the terms in a binomial expansion. And now, I mean, this thing, what is this thing? Well, what is p plus 1 minus p? That is just 1. And 1 to the n is 1. So this shows that the sum of all our probabilities is equal to 1 as desired. There was another requirement for a distribution, which we may as well check. I mean, which I should say we need to check if we want it to be a distribution. But this one, let me not write anything down, is a little bit easier. Just because these things are all going to be positive, it's just a, a product of three positive numbers, because we're always assuming that p is between 0 and 1. So this thing is also between 0 and 1. So a sum of positive numbers that adds to 1, that means each of the things in the sum has to be between 0 and 1, which means all our probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. Which, OK, let me just write this down. This also shows that 0 less than or equal to n choose k, p to the k, 1 minus p, n minus k, less than or equal to 1. So these are our verifications that the binomial distribution is actually a distribution. Hmm. So before we move on, I want to make this all a little bit less abstract and look at some examples, sort of visual examples of binomial distributions. So I've drawn some pictures that we can look at. Here is a binomial distribution. And the way I've drawn it is that these are the possible outcomes. Oopsies. Excuse me. OK, so these are the possible outcomes. So this is the binomial distribution with 10 trials. And probability of success equals 1 half. So the possible outcomes are 0 through 10. And I have plotted a bar where the size of the bar is the probability of that outcome. So you can see that getting 0 successes is quite unlikely, as well as getting all 10 successes. And it tops out right in the middle around 5, as you might expect. And there is a kind of, you know, this is not, you know, a bell curve is a specific thing. It is not this. But it has that sort of familiar kind of distribution like shape. <laughs> no, but I'm better at So let's look at what happens if we change some of these parameters. So this is a binomial distribution with the same number of trials, but we've changed the probability of success to two thirds. So we have the same possible outcomes, but you can see that the probability distribution has shifted a little bit. Now the probability of getting zero successes is very small indeed, but the probability of 10 is not nothing. And you can see that the maximum probability is here at 7, rather than where it was before, at 5. So as you change the probability of success, the probability of the number of successes changes as well in kind of the way you would predict. Although the details, you know, you will have to work out the formula to get the details. I could not have predicted, uh, if you told me their probability was two thirds, I would not have been able to tell you off the top of my head that seven was going to be the most likely outcome. So one little subtle note that I want to make as sort of a preview of things we're going to be doing later. 
um, we can also, okay, what is this example? So now I have taken 20 trials with success probability one fourth. So now the scale goes all the way out to 20. Although these probabilities out here are very small indeed. These are like one in a million to one in a billion. But basically because um, 10 trials with probability one half and 20 trials with probability one fourth, those both multiply to around five successes you would expect on average, which is shown by the fact that they both top out right here at k equals five. Um, but you may also notice that these distributions, even though they're centered in the same place, they have a slightly different shape. So first of all, you can see that this uh, n equals 10 distribution is taller around here where they top out. But actually, the n equals 20 distribution is taller on the edges here. So actually, let me see if I can illustrate that by flipping them around. You can see that n equals 20 guy is taller over here. So it's more likely to get 8 or 9 and less likely to get 4 or 5 or 6. So in addition to these parameters shifting the distribution around, they can also change the shape to make it more spread out or more narrow. And these kinds of questions about where the distribution is centered and how spread out it is are what we're going to be talking about in a few more days when we talk about expectation and variance. Uh, but for now, these are just some pretty pictures of what binomial distributions look like visually.